If you were to take a long, hard, sober look at what's going on where we live today and all around us, it would be easy for us to all cry out like the people, the Hebrew people, when the Egyptians oppressed them, that God, somebody needs to do something. Somebody needs to rise up. You know, one of our prayers ought to be that when we pray for young people in our communities, in our churches, uh, that God, would you please touch someone's heart? I remember someone talking about an illustration for Mother Teresa, the famous lady who worked on the mission field for the Catholic Church. And they said, Mother Teresa, would you pray for someone to rise up and do something about abortion? She said, I have. And God answered, yes, God gave me the person to fix it. And, and so what happened? She said he was aborted yesterday. I mean, when you look at what's going on around us, if you're not careful, like I said in the prayer time, it can get pretty negative in your mind and in your talks. And you can cry out and say, God, somebody needs to do something. Well, you get an opportunity a few times in life, and one of those opportunities that you have prayed for, God gave you an answer. Vacation Bible School. I said a couple weeks in a sermon that Jesus was the Lord of the harvest and went out through the harvest fields and he looked at the harvest, but he wasn't talking about grain. He was talking about harvesting people. And when I preached about last week, the Apostle Paul said, please pray for me that I might have the boldness that and God would open a door so that we could have the opportunity to preach the gospel to someone that might listen. Just open a door so we can have a chance that God's message might be heard because you don't get many opportunities. I mean, how many of you in this room have sat down over 10 times and got your Bible out and shared your gospel with a friend that gave their life to Jesus Christ in your lifetime? How many of you have done it more than 10 times? Not very many, is it? You don't get many opportunities. You really don't. I'll never forget standing up at a 20-year high school reunion and saying the, op the opening prayer, and I had always prayed for God to give me an opportunity to witness to my friends because in high school I wasn't a Christian. And I thought, here I stand today doing the opening prayer, and I said, the last time any of you ever saw me, you would have never thought that I would be a person that would be doing an opening prayer. God opened a door for me. But it took 20 years for that door to open. And so I had that opportunity that afternoon to walk through that open door. We pray, God, do something. God do something. He answers back. He probably wants to scream at us, I'm giving you vacation Bible school. Go get involved. You pray for God to do something, then do something. Get involved. Sign up. Work. Share. Pray. Work. Cook food. Do whatever. Drive a vehicle. Get someone. Grab your neighbor. Tell them, hey, do you want to go to vacation Bible school? They might say yes. God's answered. I can't think of a greater harvest, a greater opportunity than sitting down in a room and teaching young people the Bible. What do you have to do in life that you're so busy that you can't do that? If we're too busy doing the things that we think are important, there is nothing, Jesus said, the harvest is ripe. The harvest is not grain, it's people.
Yeah. And we have this opportunity right before us every year. You can't sit under a tree like Elisha did and sulk around thinking he's being oppressed by the outside world. We need to be like Joshua. And Joshua had to put their feet in the water for the waters to part in the Jordan at flood stage. And that took some courage because you've seen flood waters. And they knew if they dropped the Ark of the Covenant, they were probably dead. But when they put their feet in the Jordan River, it parted. You've got to be willing to do something about what you pray about. You've got to be willing to stick your neck out. You've got to be willing to do something. That's what God, and, and I have done this in my life, and I've seen it happen. I wouldn't stand here today if it wasn't for children. When I turned my life around, my home church was really growing in Oklahoma where I grew up. And this minister, he was a fire-breathing dragon. I mean, it was just really changing our town. It was really influenced. I mean, we went from 200 people on a good day to 700 people. And that's crazy in a little town. It was just really growing, so everybody got involved. And if you came to church, you got involved doing something. And I got involved in the bus ministry of, of going up and picking up kids and bringing them to church. And I gave away every Bible our family had to those kids. Uh, they had hardly any clothing. They didn't smell good. Uh, they came from places. Some of them had dirt floors in their homes on the Indian Reservation in Pawnee and we would pick them up and bring them to church. And I didn't realize that while I was doing something, and I felt like I should get involved doing something, while I'm doing that, God decided to change me. And so when you work with young people, and you think you're going to take them somewhere, and you're going to teach them something, you better look out, because they're going to be teaching you. Oh, yeah. And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for those kids. They changed my life. You say to yourself, they're so precious. They're so easily influenced. Their belief system is so powerful. You say to yourself, I wished I could believe like that. Haven't you ever had a dream? Haven't you ever had a goal? Haven't you ever had something that you wanted to do, but now you don't believe it anymore because it just is shot and gone? Not them. They believe with all their heart they're going to be an astronaut. They believe with all their heart they're going to be a fireman. They believe with all their heart they're going to be a major league baseball player. I saw a little kid go forward at a church service one time at camp. He came forward at camp and they said, what do you got on your heart this morning? He said, well... I've decided I'm not going to be a Major League Baseball player. I'm going to be a preacher. And some of the older men were kind of giggling like, how does he know he's going to be a baseball player? <laughs> Tell him that. Sometimes after working with him, you drive home and thinking, what happened to my dream? When did I quit believing? Jesus speaks very clearly about this in the Bible. When you look in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, let's see what he had to say about it. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned people and revealed them to little children. Everyone is after little children. Why? Because they're future customers. Everybody on career day is after little children. Everybody's after little children to teach them their way, their way about how things ought to work. Everybody's after the children. They have, what is it that makes them so important 
that they have all of this wisdom. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I have worked with children enough to know that I love the way they see things. If they like you, you're in good shape with them. If they don't like you, look out. They ain't drinking your kind of coffee. Oh, yeah. Little kids, they are that way. I remember when I was an intern in Indiana learning youth ministry, and I got the high-quality job at Vacation Bible School. The minister was going to talk to these hundreds of kids in the church in a play about how they ought to follow God and listen to God's Word. I was going to come into the auditorium, and they had rented a devil costume with a tail and a pitchfork, and I was going to wear it. So my job was to come in and antagonize the kids against what the preacher was saying. Don't listen to him. And then the minister said these strange words. I don't know about you kids, but I think it's time for us to get the devil out of here. At that moment, kids came over the pews. Not the out, they came to get the devil out of the building. I don't think the minister had planned on this. I look for a door near it, and a couple teenage boys thought they'd be real cocky, and they saw what was going on. We're going to stop Mike from getting out of the building so they can catch him. I knew if those kids caught me, they were going to kill me. This was no more a costume and a joke anymore. He's the devil, and he dies today. Those two boys are still planted in that doorway to this day because I smashed them in the doorway. I was not staying. I'm out of this party. <laughs> They're coming after me. you got to love kids. I mean, hey, listen, we don't like it, and it's leaving. You know what? There's a lot of things in life that ought to be that way. Why do we mess around with it? Yeah, everybody wants to be after the kids. Everybody wants to capture their mind. Everybody wants them to drive their brand and to eat their brand and to wear their brand. But you know what? When it comes to the Bible, they need to be God's people. And he's revealed wonderful things to them. But the problem with this is there's a lot of evil people in the world that want to capture the kids too. Yeah. There's a lot of evil in this world. There's people that don't want to do such very nice things to our children also out there. And we know that. I love the kids because they're so incredibly loyal to their belief system and how they changed my life. The American study says that young people in America 5 to 13 years of age are 5 to 8 times more likely to accept Jesus than any other age in their life. And at Vacation Bible School, we get an opportunity to talk to young people about how important Jesus is. I remember as worldly as my family was, we were always sent to Vacation Bible School. You got out at the church, they lined everybody up in their age groups, they made you get in a line, uh, tallest to the shortest or shortest to the tallest line up. They had the American flag, the Christian flag, the Bible. They'd play onward Christian soldiers and everybody would march into the church and sit into their row together with their teacher. And I remember that much about Vacation Bible School. And I'm thankful to the people that taught, the people that sang, the people that made refreshments, because I'm a Christian man today. And if young people can be changed through singing Christian songs and being served and taught by Christian people, I think everybody ought to be involved in Vacation Bible School. Jesus has a special place in his heart for children. We all ought to have the faith of a child. When you look in the scripture in Matthew chapter 18, he gets a little tougher about it. 
In chapter 18 at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them, and he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes this lowly position, this child, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. And a millstone weighed about 2,000 pounds to grind grain. If you put a concrete block around your neck and throw it into the lake, you're not coming up. Try a 2,000 pound millstone tied around your leg and throw it into the lake, you're not coming up. That's Jesus that said that. They, you go back to junior church this morning, and if we were to film it and show you, you ask the kids, do you all love Jesus? Yes. Do you all believe in Jesus? Yes. How many of you want to go to heaven? Yes. You come in here and ask the adults, do you, do you love Jesus? Well, I did last week. Um, this week's been kind of tough. Um, how many of you all believe in Jesus? Well, I used to. I want to. With the kids, there's no doubting. No question about it. They absolutely, unequivocally, hey, I believe it, that's the end of it, and we're ready to get the devil out of here if you don't believe it. Jesus said, you've got to love them for that. Because even the adults don't believe that way. That's what he was talking about. And if you cause them to change their mind by putting some sin in their life that makes them think differently, you're not going to make it to heaven. Let's just get that clear. Christianity is about hell and heaven. Okay? There's no sense dancing around it. And we're always trying to be Mr. Nicey or Miss Nicey about, oh, well, they had it. You know what? Listen. If you go out here and you're on the street corner and you're trying to sell meth to our children at the grade school, you're not going to go to heaven unless you change. There's some people that aren't going to make it. If you're out here trying to mess with children and to ruin their lives and to steal them from their family and sell them into slavery to some other country, you are in trouble with God. Let's just face it. And if young people want to follow God and you mess with their head so that they cannot follow God, listen, you're in trouble. Jesus said, woe to the person that causes one of these kids to not want to love God the way that they love God. You should love God the way they do. Don't try to influence them. They've got it all straight. You should envy them because of the love that they had. And we do sometimes. Adults drive home sometimes thinking, what happened to my dreams? Why can't I believe like that? That's what Jesus was talking about. But there's a lot of people out there wanting to cause our children to stumble. Wow. Wow. In sports, fundamentals will save your life. The thing, you don't see anybody walking up in the committee very often and say, listen, I'm 30 years old and I'm going to study to be a gymnast. Yeah, when, when I met, when Cindy and I met and were dating, she taught gymnastics. Fredonia used to have gymnastics in their high school. And Cindy was a balance beam person. 
you know that little piece of wood you want to and Cindy was teaching that at the YMCA teaching gymnastics yeah try to do a backflip and land on that little piece of wood have that little booger run down your rib cage yeah that smarts <laughs> yeah think about some of the things they do you learn the fundamentals of gymnastics when you're a little kid you don't learn it when you're 30 years old you learn the fundamentals of how to do it then just like rodeo people just like have you seen those hockey guys skating around uh, uh, you playing you know they had they just had the hockey championship which I, I'm not a hockey guy but I appreciate how tough they are um, and have you ever been to the ice rink yeah it's like wow those guys are amazing I can't even go across from me to you I'm like those guys are getting after it like I mean you can they learned how to do that when they were little boys they didn't learn it when they were 35 years old just like rodeo people same thing and they learn fundamentals in baseball will save your life and when you see someone struggling in sports what you do as a coach you go up to them and you say go back to your fundamentals they will save your life it's a stick and a ball quit thinking and hit it I used to have a buddy if you were struggling and roping he would come up to you in your horse and he would say to you in the box listen we got to doctor this steer before he gets in the pond would you rope him for me please get him before he gets in the pond and what he was saying is quit thinking and go out here and rope that steer you're overthinking this deal just get it done and in baseball or any other sport or basketball the fundamentals that you learned as a child are the very thing that save you when you get older and in Christianity is no different we put the Bible in children's hearts we teach them the fundamentals of Christianity and throughout life we can go up to them and say listen go back to the fundamentals get into your Bible read the scripture look at it the Bible will save your life it's a book that saves go find your Bible get it out read it let God work through it memorize it study it learn about it use those fundamentals in your life they will always save you fundamentals are so important in everything that we do VBS is a great place to learn those fundamentals look at 1 Timothy chapter 4 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 command and teach these things don't let anyone look down on you because you are young but set an example for the believers in speech in conduct in love in faith in purity until I come devote yourselves to the public reading of scripture to preaching and to teaching and above else don't neglect your gift we get an opportunity to teach kids about these very important things speech conduct love faith purity we train all of our young people in the fundamentals of life a lot of you guys are farmers it is important to you at an early age to teach your kids how to drive a tractor there's a lot of people here at work cattle it's important for y'all to learn at an early age how to work cattle every one of you learned the number one lesson in farming and ranching shut the gate didn't you everybody in here that farms and ranches learned that one and you remember that one fundamental shut the gate I won't tell you again and guess what we learned that fundamental we tell it to everybody else and we do it with so emphatically that everybody else generations down the road goes why do you yell when you say that <laughs> because we were yelled at you just have to say it that way and or you know 
It, it's so, we, we teach people how to drive. We teach them how to shoot. We teach them how to sell things. We teach them how to dress. We teach them how to tie their shoes. We train our young people in every phase of life because we want them to function properly. We train them in education. Well, then why don't we train them in holiness and purity and righteousness? Because what it says in the book, in 2 Timothy, he said, hey, listen, physical training is of some value, but godliness has value throughout eternity. I love sports. I'll admit it. But you know what? Sports isn't going to save my life for eternity. Knowing the Bible will. Physical training has some value. You know, listen, you can go out here and run every day. You can go to the gym every day, work out. You can look buffed. You can feel good while you're buffed. You can feel good while you're running. But you know, I got news for you. You're going to die. You can die healthy or you can die unhealthy. But you're going to die. So no matter where you are, you better learn godliness and holiness and righteousness so that when you die, you get to go to heaven. Haven't you seen the commercial on TV? When you die, you're, you're sitting there kind of watching a ball game and all of a sudden, when you die, okay, are you going to go to heaven? And I was like, well, I'm planning on it. <laughs> That's kind of a crazy commercial. Just hits everybody right in the face. Okay, let's be straight out with it. And Vacation Bible School is a great place for us to train young people about godliness and righteousness and holiness. Why, why are we so afraid to teach someone to say no to something? Why do we have to feel guilty to teach someone to say no to something? We should be proud that we teach young people to want to love God and say no to sin. We should feel very good about that. And we get that opportunity. Remember what Jesus said. It would be better for you to have a 2,000 pound millstone tied around your neck and thrown in the deepest part of the sea and the Mariana Trench and the Pacific Ocean is the deepest part and how many miles deep is that? What's that? Quite a few. Yeah, he says seven or eight miles deep. You're not coming up. There's a lot of people teaching a lot of things to children and they better watch out. They better make sure that it's the things that God wants them to know because we are going to have to answer for every word and deed. Matthew 19, Jesus isn't done yet about talking about children. In verses 13 and 15 of Matthew 19, then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place in his hands on them and to pray for them. But the disciples rebuked him. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. You should envy them. The Bible is very clear about people who cannot take care of themselves when you study the Bible. And they have a front row ticket in heaven, and so you should envy them in life because they're getting to heaven, they have a free ticket. And for children, if they have not reached the age of accountability in their life, if something happens to them, they have a front row seat in heaven, guaranteed. You should every, every young person you know that has not reached the age of accountability in their life you should envy them because they're better off than you are. They know for certain they will be with the Lord if something happens to them. Do you? 
Are you sure about your life? God is certain. Hey, listen, they belong to the Lord. They're His. Man, what a blessing. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, we have been entrusted with the sacred things of God. You know what that means? You are entrusted with the sacred things of God. God has put you in charge of the farm, and he's out of town. God has put you in charge of the home or the business, and you're running it, and he's out of town. Remember the first time at your business where you work, where the boss let you be in charge, and they were gone? And you had to take care of all the employees and do all the work and do everything. Remember being entrusted with that and what a feeling that was? God has entrusted you with the sacred things of His that are important, and that is preaching the gospel to little children. He has given you this duty to teach the fundamentals of His teachings to children. And we must prove faithful about doing that. I think Vacation Bible School has quite a responsibility, doesn't it? And you think that you're going to come and change their life. They are the lifeblood. I, I, I've told you this quite a while ago, but when I went to a church in Missouri, and this is a true story, I met a couple and they said, here's a couple we'd like to introduce you to. And I said, okay. My wife and I were standing there. This is Bob and Bobette Stuckey. Okay. Hi, Bob and Bobette. I told him, is it Bob and Bobette Stuckey? Yes, that's their name. And he was a farmer, a very neat Christian man, one of the elders of the church there. Very, very godly man. You would love him. And when he would get upset or about talking about the children in a board meeting or an elders meeting, he would say, I'll tell you what, I'll take all of you out here in Missouri to a little church that's been closed for years and there's vines and trees crawling all over the building, growing all around it. He said that used to be a good little church when I was a kid, but they lost one generation of young people from that church and it died. And it's been like that ever since. He said the young people are the lifeblood of our church. And we have an important responsibility that God has entrusted to us to teach them the Bible. So that they can grow up and have a great love and a knowledge of God. And I've never forgotten that. It is a wonderful opportunity. They're not only the lifeblood of your church, they are the future of your community. They're the future mothers and fathers of tomorrow. And they are the very people that would decide which retirement home you're going to live in. Have you thought about that? And you get a chance to put the fundamentals in their heart right now. And they will be making the decisions about your life in the future. So think about that. Now, not, don't think about it. Not right now. She's already deciding where she wants to put her mom and dad. You're, you're, you're jumping the gun on me, girl. Okay. Save that for another day. But I think we have to remind ourselves that Jesus looked to little children as something very precious, very powerful. When you're working with the young people, well, I'm too busy to go work with these kids. I'm too busy to go do this. I'm too busy to go do that. But you know what? There's nobody too busy to go work with some young people to teach them the Word of God so that their life can turn out the way that God wants them to turn out. You get to play a part in that at Vacation Bible School. And that's an awesome opportunity that we have to be entrusted with God's teachings. In the message version of the New Testament, 
and the Old Testament version. It says this in Proverbs 22.6, point your kids in the right direction, and when they're old, they won't be lost. I like that version of that verse. What an awesome opportunity to teach the Bible to someone so they can know how to grow up, so they can know how to live. There's a time in life that we say, well, we don't want God to be a part of our life. He's cramping my style. Well, yeah, you can say that. There's also a time in life when things are really going rough and you say to God, I need some help. And you can almost hear this little voice. Go back to your fundamentals. Go back to your ABCs. Find your Bible. Dust it off. Start reading it. Start listening to what God's saying to you. He's got the answers for your life. Remember what your vacation Bible school teacher taught you? I know this sounds corny, but if you go home to where we all got little stuff stored away and everybody's got something stuck back in a corner that's kind of corny, you know what I have in a footlocker of things that I have tucked away? I got two things that I made when I was in my craft from Vacation Bible School. I've got my plaque with my decoupage baseball player that the craft teacher taught me how to make at Vacation Bible School. And I pull it. Nobody else would know if they went there. What is that? That's my craft that I made as a little kid from Vacation Bible School, stuck down in the bottom. Never threw it away. Never burned it up. Had to keep it. Made it at VBS. You think, well, it was just a craft we made. It was just something silly. Never count out the powerful way that God can change a life. It might just be a craft that day. It might be a life-changing experience for that young person. That person you're teaching might be the next governor of the state of Kansas. That person that you're teaching might be the next heart surgeon at your hospital or the principal of your high school. You never know what God's going to do with the heart of a young person that is yielded to him with the dreams and goals that they might have. This morning, as we wind our service down and get ready to close, listen, it, we've prayed, and God has answered, and he's given us a wonderful opportunity, a harvest of young people, an open door to preach the gospel, a place to use our gifts and our talents and abilities so God can help other young people to learn how to use theirs. And uh, I hope that you will uh, find our director, uh, which is Jesse, by the way. I have had you wave two weeks in a row. See how happy she is? That's what being a BBS director does to you. Mm -hmm. Now you be nice, okay? <laughs> but uh, I think that we water it down sometimes, the importance of helping someone change their life. Because I will never forget helping kids how it changed mine. All I did was want to help at church. I took kids home to Pawnee to the reservation. Lady runs out to my vehicle. She has bruises on her arms, bruises on her legs. She says, don't let my children, my husband's trying to kill me. I'm like, and so what do you want me to do? I, I'm just helping at church. And I thought to myself, as that situation unfolded, I drove home and I thought, if I don't work with kids, who else is going to? That day changed my life. I didn't know it, but it was the beginning of God changing me 
into a different person. Those young people, you got to watch out. They'll get a hold of your heart. They'll get a hold of you. But you know that's okay. I'm proud because of those moments. Because when you work with young people here at church, they will change you too. But maybe we need some tweaking. Maybe someone needs to chip away at us and shape us. We always thought it would be someone older and wiser. We never thought it would be someone younger and wiser that can help us to change our lives. Maybe this morning you need to think about changing yours as we stand and as we sing today. treasure that 